Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Uh, we welcome you to uh, this beautiful Sabbath morning in Central Florida. Uh, it's March the 18th, and uh, grateful that you're with us today. Before we begin our Sabbath school time together, prophecy before our eyes, let's kneel together for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful today for, uh, for your faithfulness, uh, your faithfulness which is new every morning, and your faithfulness is great, and we thank you for it. We thank you for the sure word of prophecy. We thank you for your promises. Uh, we thank you for the privileges, the opportunities that are ours to share the three angels' messages with this planet. We just pray. Uh, we pray for discernment today. We pray for clarity, for uh, wisdom, and for clarity of mind. And then, of course, we pray for power. And all these gifts come from the Holy Spirit. We pray for that power to be overcomers to be victorious over sin. Bless us and anoint our eyes with ISAB just now. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, we were singing this morning, standing on the promises, and how abundant and wonderful God's promises are. We're gonna start with a few this morning uh, Psalms 103, wonderful promises here. Psalms 103, uh, David declared, <laughs> uh, verses 1 through 5, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. Who healeth all thy diseases. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction. Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. Who satisfieth thy mouth with good things. So that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. How precious are those promises. Uh, going down a little bit further in Psalm 103, David said, Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. Praise God this morning, um, precious promises in Psalms 103. One other passage I just want to look at just for a moment, Daniel chapter 3, Daniel chapter 3, verse 25, as God's law was made void in the days of Nebuchadnezzar, as he set up an image and wanted everyone to bow to it. You know, it looked as though God's children who were faithful had somehow been forsaken. But at the right time, at the right moment, Daniel 3 verse 25 declares, He answered Nebuchadnezzar and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Awesome promise for us this morning. As we go through our lives day by day, as we face difficulties, as we see things unraveling in this world, we have this awesome promise 
that Christ still walks in fire with his children. Paul? You know what the sad thing is? Many people don't know that verse, as Seventh-day Adventists included. Do you know why? Because in any other translation other than the King James, you know how that verse reads? God's, uh, G-O-D-S, and it's small g. They don't know that Nebuchadnezzar saw Jesus Christ, they pagan gods. So they don't know what that means. And unless Seventh-day Adventists get rid of these Bibles at their homes and churches, well, you can use them for reference, but calling it the Word of God, there's not going to be any blessing from these verses. And man is going to be their God. Because in the NIV and every translation other than the King James, that word reads G-O-D-S, small g. Well, Very significant change. Absolutely, Paul. Absolutely. I, just point in ca case in point. Sure, sure. Appreciate the comment. Uh, we can be so thankful this morning that Jesus, the Son of God, victor over the tomb, over everything in this planet, walks in fire with his children. I'm grateful today for that promise. All right. We're going to look this morning, prophecy before our eyes. You know, about a month, a little bit over a month ago, uh, there was in a Kentucky university, a place called Asbury University, which I understand from the little studying I've done on it, it's a Methodist university, but... Uh, <laughs> You know, folk, anymore, when we talk about a university that has a certain name on it, uh, let's make no mistake that there are many Roman Catholic professors at this small uh, Asbury University in Kentucky. So, and I, I would imagine and suspect that that is true right across the spectrum every denomination because denominations today are all about ecumenism the ecumenical movement so on february 8th a routine chapel service started at kentucky's asbury university and here it is just a small campus in kentucky the chapel service rapidly grew into a nonstop prayer session that is now being called a revival by many. People from other colleges and universities are traveling thousands of miles to join the worship session after videos of the event went viral on TikTok. Asbury is a small Methodist Christian college in Wilmore where at the tail end of the chapel meeting, Wednesday, February 8, some of the students stayed back and informally assembled in a gathering to continue their prayers. So that's what went on, folk. And eyewitnesses, all the eyewitnesses were saying, oh, the Holy Spirit was poured out with power. And, and people from all different denominations were coming together in unity and in revival. Well, we're going to analyze that this morning. A Catholic priest who saw, who visited Asbury, a Father Fisher, uh, stated this, and this is taken from the DetroitCatholic.com. Jesus was right next to me at Asbury. Uh, Catholics on fire with the Holy Spirit. Let's hear what this man had to say. He told the news, OSV News, he visited Asbury after celebrating Sunday Mass, February 12, saw several current and former Lexington Catholic high school students there. Hands were raised, people were singing, all were in one accord, said Father Fisher adding he was reminded of Psalm 133.1, where David says, How good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together as one. 
Father Fisher, who wore his alb and stole while at Asbury, told OSV News he got into praise mode during what he called the modernized taze experience. Now, we're going to look at that taze experience in just a minute. But he found himself filled with love. The Asbury phenomenon is pure, definitely of God, definitely of the Holy Spirit, he said. This is a real fascinating phenomena, friends. It it's, was at Asbury, and it's something we see people across the world. We've, we've seen this for the last six decades where in the Pentecostal movement, people are claiming to have the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, we're going to analyze here momentarily in what mode, for what purpose, does the Holy Spirit work in people's lives? Very important, friends, as we see this counterfeit this counterfeit moving, not of God, but of demon spirits. The fruits of the gathering are already apparent. The leader said, who has heard confessions, has offered healing prayers, including one man struggling with addiction. I think there is truly a way to tie this to the Eucharistic revival, but there's got to be a willingness to be open to the Holy Spirit who can say, I don't want to be finished at 8 p.m. Can your church handle that? Is it willing? I'm noticing in these statements, it's all about unity. It's all about uh you know, letting the Holy Spirit work so that we have this, you know, we, we stay till midnight, we stay till three in the morning. Uh, let's see what's going on here. Cody, go ahead, please. I just, I just want to say, and I know you're probably going to take the time to, to prove all this out, but uh, Mrs. White is very clear that any type of revival movement that comes from the Holy Spirit will also be coupled with reformation. So true revival will lead to true reformation. They'll happen at the same time. And uh, the problem with the Asbury revivals is they're all emotion driven. Their doctrine's incorrect. Um, we also know that apostate Protestantism makes up what, that, what uh, that university is, which is a Methodist university, which is involved in ecumenism, all of which um, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, um, and the Father would have nothing to do with. So you have to ask the question, because these people are feeling something. It's all emotion-driven, but they are feeling something. Something's telling them to stay there. So which, which spirit is it? And you come to a conclusion, it's not, this, is not, this is beyond man. So this is not either it's one or the other. And if it's not one, because it's doctrinally provable that it's not one, then it has to be by process of elimination demonic in nature no question Cody and it it reminds me Cody of our passages there in Revelation 16 where it talks about a final false revival Revelation 16 under the sixth plague actually but the sixth plague is the culmination of a movement that has manifested itself for a long time Revelation 16, 13, and 14 says, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Now, let's just quickly identify the dragon, of course, is the devil. His masterpiece of deception is spiritualism. The mouth of the beast is Rome, or the papacy, and out of the mouth of the false prophet is apostate Protestantism. So we see these elements at Asbury, right here, described in Revelation 16, 13, 
And how does the Bible define them? Well, verse 14 says, For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So we have the elements at Asbury. We have the papacy. We have apostate Protestantism. And we have spiritualistic manifestations. Exactly what we have described here in Revelation 16, 13 and verse 14 very clearly says, these are the spirits of devils working miracles. Paul? There's two buzzwords in there that you mentioned, that you read about the observance of what happened there, that Seventh-day Adventists should make their brain explode. First of all, the word love. Well, in Mrs. White's vision in early writings, she saw exactly this setup when Lucifer usurped the throne in the holy place. What did she say happened? He breathed on them. And what was it? Love. But it was not a sustaining love. It was a cold love. Also, oh, and addicts were healed. Or there was somebody, well, Willow Creek Project is... Uh, needs-based ministry. What has that got to do with anything? An addict was healed. Other than, you met a need. Who met the need? You see, so at Venice, if they're doing their homework, should see clearly, okay, they're not, gonna, they're not reading Revelation. I'm telling you that. Mm -hmm. And if they got an NIV, what you read is not what you read, and they're telling you you're wrong. However, in the spirit of prophecy, this is addressed clearly. Two buzzwords in there that should go off in their brain and say, wait a minute, something's wrong here. We were warned about this. Absolutely. Man meeting man's needs, love, when the doctrine is all wrong, has to only come from who? The usurper. Absolutely, Paul. Paul, great point. Uh, one piece, I'm going to pick on one little piece. True unity true love and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit always are coupled with submissive obedience to the law of God, to sound teaching. Those all go together. And if you separate them, as we see at Asbury, it's about unity, it's about love. But there's no discussion of doctrine. There's no discussion of reformation as Cody stated. There is no discussion of obedience. The Holy Spirit is not there. And we're gonna see that momentarily. So this Taz experience, I wanted to find out what that was. I thought, what is the Taz experience? The Taz community fits into contemporary global Christianity and its ecumenical message of tolerance and solidarity appeals to young Christians who wish to reconcile their religious identity with an increasingly modern and secular world. To better understand Taz experiences, I apply the term communities, which anthropologists use to refer to the unstructured state in which all members of a community are equal, allowing them to share a common experience, usually through a rite of passage such as pilgrimage. Now, folk, All that the Taz experience is about, as we read this statement, and this was something I just pulled off the internet, looking up, because I'd never heard the word Taz experience in my life before this week. It's all about ecumenism. It's all about community. It's all about common, what we have in common. Now, folk, <laughs> that's what that was all about. 
feeling, love, unity. Everyone holds on to their beliefs. Everyone remains in their own non-biblical positions. And they call that the working of the Holy Spirit. Now, this was Asbury folk, you know, the, the lifting up of hands, the, the, the good feelings, the, you know, let's love one another. Friends, notice what Acts chapter 5, 29 to 32 has to say about what happens when the Holy Spirit is present. Notice these passages. Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. What a revolutionary idea that is. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. Friends, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Peter connected two ideas. Where the Holy Spirit is manifest, there is obedience to God's commands. That's what the Apostle Peter said. This is what was lacking at Asper. Completely lacking, folk. Because of that lack, one has to then conclude this was not the working of the Holy Spirit. This was the working of the Spirit we see described in Revelation 13. These were the spirits of devils working miracles, bringing everybody together on a common good where God was not being honored. Paul? Also in the book of Acts, and in, in your definition up there, everyone holding on to their beliefs. Well, this is what was missing too. What does it say when the Holy Spirit came and they were of, of one accord? They had one belief. This is, this is not going to equal unity, this is going to equal dissension, because how long is it going to be before they're going to arguing who, be arguing whose belief is correct? Just like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Absolutely. So again, there's another red flag of one accord. Absolutely. It was like St. Louis when the Pope went. Remember those pictures? It's the Absolutely. same thing. It's Absolutely. Roman Catholicism. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, at this point, I want to take a look at John 17 for just a moment. John 17, appreciate your comments, Paul. Uh, John chapter 17, when Jesus talked about unity, this is critical, friends, where Jesus talked, uh, John 17, verse 11, Jesus said, and now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father, Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. In the mind of Christ, unity as he prayed for his disciples in John 17, that is directly connected to what Paul was just saying. Because in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost, when they were of one accord, there was unity of teaching. Notice in the heart of Christ's prayer of unity, John 17, verse 17. Jesus declared, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Folk, in the mind of Christ, in the mind of Christ, unity 
sanctification, the exaltation of Bible truth. And of course, in Psalms 119, the Bible says, well, let's read it. All thy commandments, Psalms 119, 142, Psalms 119, 142. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. So, folk, in Christ's prayer for unity in John 17, that unity was coupled with the experience of sanctification. The experience of sanctification is obedience to God's commands. And Jesus also said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Well, Psalms 119, 142 says, Thy law is the truth. So in Christ's prayer for unity, the exaltation of God's law is the focal point of all true unity. Cody? I just want to say as well that, you know, if we are, if we are students of the Bible and students of history, we don't have to be in doubt or in question as to what a real revival and reformation looks like. In Christ's day, they killed him for his message. And for the fact that he walked the walk and talked the talk, his, his disciples went out with the message of prophecy of the coming of the Messiah being fulfilled, first to the synagogues, then to the Gentiles. The apostle Paul was stoned for that message. When, when the people that did accept the message asked Peter, what shall they do to be saved? It wasn't an emotional sort of gathering in this way. It was a very serious intellectual thing. And he told them, repent and believe Absolutely. the gospel. That's what you have to do. Absolutely. If you fast forward to the Reformation, it was a doctrinal issue. There was a sword driven into the church immediately. Amen. Amen. Because they said, they said that justification is by faith alone, along with the other solas of, of the Reformation. And there was revival, and there was a Reformation at that time. But it doesn't look like this. No. We know what this type of reformation, this type of revival uh, looks like because we've seen it before in places like Jim Jones and the, the People's Church. They had, they had very p addicts overcoming and, and, and crying and tears and, and all this prayer session stuff. What did that lead to? Murder. Exactly. And what spirit was behind it? It's very good. So we have, we have, if we look at history in the Bible, we, we can see what a real revival is. Absolutely, Cody. Great point. Great point. Appreciate it. Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27. What Peter was saying was something very clearly that was also laid out in the Old Testament scriptures. Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27 says, A new heart also will I give you. A new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit. So here is the work of the Holy Spirit, just as we saw it in Acts chapter 5. And I will put my spirit within you. For what purpose? For, for praise, for uh, feeling, for, for good feelings? No. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Now, friends, we know very clearly from Psalms 119 that David uses words. Well, let's read it. Let's read it. Psalms 119, it's divided into sections. 
Let's just notice Psalms 119, 1 to 8. Because God's laws of the Ten Commandments are mentioned in Psalms 119, 1 to 8, 9 to 16, 17 to 24, 25 to 32. It's divided into sections of eight verses. And with each verse, there is a reference to statutes, judgments, laws, word, his ways. They all mean the same thing. So when Ezekiel talks about causing you to walk in my statutes, it's saying the Holy Spirit will empower us to walk in God's commandments. And that is the true manifestation of the revival of the Holy Spirit. It will be seen in obedience to all of God's commands. Notice Psalm 119. We'll just read the first eight verses. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. So there's God's law. Verse 2. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies. Testimonies is a reference back to God's law. And that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. His ways. A reference back to God's commandments. Verse 4. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Well, what is the word there in verse 4? That is a reference back to God's law. Precepts. Verse 5. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Back to God's law. Verse 6. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. Commandments. Verse 7, I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteous judgment. Reference back to God's law. Verse 8, I will keep thy statutes. O oh, forsake me not utterly. Statutes. So folk, repeatedly in each section of Psalms 119, we have references back to the Ten Commandments. So when Ezekiel describes the work of the Holy Spirit, he says the true manifestation of the Holy Spirit will be seen where people are exalting God's statutes, which are his Ten Commandments. And ye shall keep my judgments, another reference to the Ten Commandments, and do them. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. And where the true Holy Spirit is, there will be seen obedience to God's command. Baptism of the Holy Spirit. What is it? When we talk about the baptism so much in our world today, it's, oh, well, that's the gift of tongues. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what Ezekiel said. That's not what Acts 5 said, friends. Notice this beautiful statement, Desire of Ages, page 671. In fact, before we read that, Isaiah 59, 19. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun when the enemy shall come in like a flood. The spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. So when the devil seeks to destroy us, and seeks to lead us away from God's commands. The Bible promises the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, 
will lift up a standard against him. That's the true manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Desire of Ages. The Spirit was to be given as a regenerating agent. Without this, the sacrifice of Christ would have been of no avail. The power of evil had been strengthening for centuries. The submission of men to this satanic captivity was amazing. Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead, who would come with no modified energy, but in the fullness of divine power. It is the spirit that makes effectual what has been wrought out by the world's redeemer. It is by the spirit that the heart is made pure. Exactly what we've read in Acts chapter 5 and in Ezekiel chapter 36. Was this the Holy Spirit? The Bible says when God's children are in submission to his authority, walking in the light they have received, and obeying his commandments through faith in his power. There will be unity and peace among God's children. The Holy Spirit enables God's children to overcome sin and to obey his law. True unity, friends, true revival of the Holy Spirit leads to exaltation of God's law, peace and unity among God's children. Romans 8, 13 and 14 is very clear. If ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Again, what is the role of the Holy Spirit? To help us mortify the deeds of the body. Great controversy has warned us, friend, pages 464 and 465. Ellen White declared in those churches which he can bring under his deceptive power, he will make it appear that God's special blessing is poured out. There will be manifest what is thought to be great religious interest. Multitudes will exalt that God is working marvelously for them when the work is that of another spirit. Under a religious guise, Satan will seek to extend his influence over the Christian world. In many of the revivals which have occurred during the last half century, the same influences have been at work to a greater or lesser degree that will be manifest in the more extensive movements of the future. There's an emotional excitement, a mingling of the true with the false that is well adapted to mislead. This is exactly what happened at Asbury. None need be deceived. In the light of God's word, it is not difficult to determine the nature of these movements. Whenever men neglect the testimony of the Bible, turning away from those plain soul-testing truths which require self-denial and renunciation of the world, there we may be sure that God's blessing is not bestowed. You know, friends, had a gentleman from Floral City this week who got our brochure, you know, what's happening to America. He wrote me a letter. He said, I'm sure glad you're trying to wake up America 
America's got to return to their Christian roots. And he said, I'm enclosing for you some letters that I have written to people to try to wake America up. Well, I'm listening very carefully to what he's saying. In the very first letter, which he wrote about two weeks ago, it says in there, didn't, weren't Americans awake to the fact that God is moving mightily? Didn't you see what happened at Asbury? Well, I immediately knew exactly where that man was coming from. That man believed that what happened, there was something moral and it was good at Asbury. Therefore, it was of God in this man's mind. I thought, well, clearly the man sees the moral collapse of this country, but he doesn't understand the solution. So I thought, what should I do? Should I just throw his letter away? He didn't ask for any material because in his mind, he had the truth. I sent him a great controversy. <laughs> I hope he will read it and understand the phenomena in this country where the moral collapse is going to have a backlash to where people will want to legislate morality. And that's what will happen. And unless we have clear discernment from the Holy Spirit, we will embrace the false revival to legislate morality. In the truths of his word, God has given to men a revelation of himself, and to all who accept them, they are a shield against the deceptions of Satan. It is a neglect of these truths that has opened the door to the evils which are now becoming so widespread in the religious world. I hope this gentleman in Floral City will take the time to read the great controversy and have clarity as to what is really going on. When the focus is on feeling, when the focus is on ecumenical unity, when the focus is on raucous music, we know the Holy Spirit is not there and the Lord is not being glorified. The Holy Spirit will bring obedience, brotherly love, and a supreme desire to serve God in everything. Make no mistake, friends, again, the Holy Spirit, apart from law, is not the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to shift gears for just a few more minutes here. To another aspect of current events which is prophecy unfolding right before our eyes. Right before our eyes. Pope Francis, his encyclicals, the ones he has written have tended to attract widespread attention outside the Catholic Church. Laudato Si, our care on care for our common home, that's all about climate change, played an important role in building momentum for the Paris Climate Accords, an agreement the Pope called historic. That's all about climate change, friend. That's all about Sunday. In 2020, Francis published another encyclical, Fratelli Tutti, on fraternity and social friendship. What is that about? It's about ecumenism. It's about uniting together to save the planet. 
That's what we have in these two encyclicals. Ecumenical unity to save the planet. Francis used the parable of the Good Samaritan to argue for greater solidarity between nations, cultures, and faiths to meet the global challenges of poverty, migration, and environmental degradation. Friends, what does Francis mean when he uses the word fraternity, solidarity, social friendship? Francis means ecumenical unity. Again, the true unity that Christ prayed for in John 17? Not at all. Because it is a unity not based in truth, but it's based in Francis's mind. This came from Advent Messenger, a movement within political circles that is bringing everyone closer together. One earth, one family, one future is the theme of the 2023 G20 International Forum which will be held in India later this year. This message is based on Francis's encyclical Fratelli Tutti, which asserts that all the world's economies, cultures, religions, and politics are interconnected and interdependent. The G20, which consists of Argentina, Australia, Brazil, Canada, China, France, Germany, India, Indonesia, and all the rest of those nations, will meet this year to work on strengthening their connections with one another, as instructed in Francis's encyclical Fratelli Tutti. Keep in mind that the G20 comprises two-thirds of the world's population and 80% of the global economy. Friends, we are watching, we are seeing, as we've seen this morning through Asbury, through Francis's encyclicals, Laudato Si, Fratelli Tutti, we are seeing the coming together of Revelation chapter 13. We are watching it unfold right before our eyes. Bible prophecy foretold, Revelation 13. I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast, the papal power, rise up out of the sea over in Europe, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his head's the name of blasphemy. Blasphemy from Mark 2, 5 to 7, claiming you have power to forgive sins. John 10, verse 30 to 33, claiming power that you and God are one. This beast power, friends, can only be the papacy. We go on, the beast which I saw had characteristics of the Greeks, the feet of a bear, Medo-Persia, the mouth of a lion, Babylon. And the papacy receives her power, seat, and great authority from the dragon, whom Revelation 12 declares is the devil himself. One of his heads was wounded to death. That was in 1798. His deadly wound was healed in the 20th century. And all the world is wondering, wondered after the beast. We're watching this, friends, right before our eyes. They worshipped the dragon which gave power to the beast. They worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? We know from Matthew chapter 15, 1 to 9, that true and false worship 
is connected to the commandments of God. So the papacy would exalt man-made tradition. Man-made tradition, Sunday tradition. Started it in the dark ages, continues it on today. It was given to him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Power was given him to continue 40 and two months. That's the 1260 year period of papal supremacy from 538 to 1798. Papacy opened his mouth in blasphemy, claiming to be God, claiming he can forgive sins, to blaspheme God's name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. It was given him to make war with the saints, persecuting God's children, to open Overcome them. Power was given him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, shall honor his Sunday tradition, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. Let him hear. Friends, this is Bible prophecy being opened up right before our eyes. Daniel 7, verses 23 to 25, talking about the same power, the same power doing the exact same things. Revelation 17, Revelation 17, Babylon the Great. All of these prophecies, friends, in the sure word of prophecy. Will we heed them? Will we listen to them? You know, I was chatting with a young man last evening. And we were talking about current events. And he said, you know, there, there has to be some authority in this world that we don't really see. I said, yeah, there is. He said, is it the money people? I said, no, it's not. He said, well, who is it then? I said, it's the papacy. It's the Roman Catholic church, state, political system. They're running the world. He said, are you kidding me? Are, is that possible? I said, the Bible says so. It is possible. And that's exactly what the Bible says. We're going to close with this statement from Revelation 17. There came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying to me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. All the Protestant reformers all believed that the great whore was Rome. So any true Protestant today would believe that too if you believe your founding fathers. The Bible tells us the papacy with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. The kings of the earth, friends, are Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi, Mitch McConnell, and all the leaders. Now granted, God has his men in there. But the great bulk of the leaders of our world are committing fornication with the papacy. That's what the Bible teaches, friend. 
The inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. You know, in my talk with the young man last night, he said to me, how is it that you think you know and nobody else knows? I said, well, there are others that know what I just said. But I said, the earth, the people of this earth, have accepted false ideas, not in harmony with Scripture. They're drunk with the wine of that fornication. Carried me away into the spirit, into the wilderness. I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, decked with gold and precious stones, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Friends, this was Asbury. This was Asbury. The papacy united with her harlot daughters, Methodism at Asbury, uniting together to give the earth an abominable deception at Asbury. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Friends, prophecy right before your eyes and praise God this morning that we can stand on his promises and praise God today that we can accept the gift of the Holy Spirit to do in us and for us what we can't do for ourselves let us pray Dear Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you that the promise you gave in the upper room 20 centuries ago is still true today. Thank you for the promise you made to your children. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. We are thankful today for the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we pray for his power to enable and empower us to walk in your statutes, in your judgments, and in your laws. That all the world would see your great and magnanimous character through your law manifest in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.